Thank you. So, first of all, I must just say uh, that uh, I'm uh, extremely impressed with what Vista has achieved over, over since its beginning. It's very, very impressive, so congratulations to that. Uh, I realized that uh, I thought I had 15 minutes, so I will skip uh, quickly through, and some of my previous, uh, previous speakers have already touched on some of the issues which I, I was going to talk about as well, so I will go quickly through that. But my topic is really logistics and infrastructure as, uh, as uh, preconditions, but not least catalysts for Arctic development. Briefly on Trudy Group, we are a traditional Norwegian ship owner who has moved away from owning ships at the main purpose to logistics, uh, port infra infrastructure and port development in the Arctic. And uh, we have a focus on east-west cargo flows uh, and, of course, the activities in the, in the north as well. Uh, <coughs> we, uh, we, have, we started our activity in the Arctic uh, in Kirkenes, actually, which was mentioned which is on the border to Russia. And it was really our interest for, for uh, uh, transportation linked and logistics linked to Russia, which brought it, us there. Today, uh, we are involved in port development in Kirkenes. Uh, we are involved in uh, the iron ore mine uh, in Kirkenes, which is presently closed, but we are working to reopen it. And in the transportation of uh, uh, aggregates, stone, to the Arctic from, from Kirkenes. And we are involved in oil transshipment, which was mentioned here uh, from Sokonflot's side. And through the, the mine, we have been involved in the northern development of the Northern Sea Route. So why are we so interested in this part of the Arctic? This is really the reason. It's an ice-free wedge deep into the Arctic, and it's ice-free year-round, which means that it can serve as a platform for serving other activities in other parts of the Arctic. Uh, in September 2010, uh, the mine, the iron ore mine in Kirkenes had been reopened. We were shipping through Suez to China and we said we have to see if it's possible to ship via the Northern Sea Route to China. And this, the Northern Sea Route project 2010, became the result of that. And this vessel, carrying 41,000 tons of iron ore from Kirkenes to China, was the first truly international transit through the Northern Sea Route. It's been used for 70 years by, by, China, by Russia, of course, but this was a non-Russian cargo on a non-Russian ship between two non-Russian ports, i.e. the Northern Sea Route was in, open for international transit. Thereafter, uh, from the very low numbers in the beginning, 2010, of course, also the Baltica, the Sankonflot vessel Baltica passed, it increased to 71 vessels and then decreased again. And the reason for that, these are very minute numbers in the big picture, because uh, Suez Canal is catering for 18,000 vessels. But what was important was that it was used by a wide range of, of, of vessels. It meant it made sense with the right conditions, and spe specifically the right market conditions, oil fuel price conditions. It made sense to use the Northern Sea Route. But in the medium term, we believe that is really the destinational shipping in and out of the Arctic, using, employing specialized vessels, which are very expensive, which we saw from Sokomplot, uh, serving year-round activities in, in developing the resources of, of the Arctic. And uh, in this context, we believe that this ice-free wedge into the Arctic, which you saw earlier, can serve, both on the Russian side and the Norwegian side, serve these vessels and these resource developments by offering transshipment from these very expensive vessels to con uh, conventional vessels going to the market. This is an example of oil and gas, which we have been conducting in uh, close to uh, Honningsvog, which is close to North, uh, North Cape, and where we have done a number of cargos, uh, Russian cargos, the Varande cargos for one year, uh, also Sokonflot we have served, and uh, uh, in the future it might also be uh, there might be other products like gas and so on. This you already saw. This is a very impressive uh, project. Uh, Russia is, of course, absolutely in the forefront of developing the Arctic, by far. There's no country which can even uh, get in close to it. The Amal project, you know about it. What's interesting here is that it's using the, the Arctic routes to the east during the summertime and to the west 
when the, uh, when the, the ice is too thick and too, the transportation will be too slow, it will go to the west. So they're operating these uh, very uh, expensive and specialized vessels, which we saw before, but they should be used in a most efficient most efficient way, because at the price of $340 million per ship, 15 of them, they have to be used efficiently. Other specialized ships which were used to, to develop the, and where logistics matter, used to develop the Yamal LNG project. This one was made in, in China, specialized, specially built. But also simpler products like rock are dependent on, on logistics, or even more dependent on logistics. And in this case, for the development of the Sabeta port and Yamal LNG, both uh, Russian but, but also Norwegian rock was used, coming from Kekenes, from our deposits in Kekenes. Because we could ship in 56,000 or close to 60,000 ton vessels, and it becomes logistically competitive. This is a, a map uh, uh, which is produced by the Center for High North Logistics, which is mapping everything that is going on. And of course, you see that the main activity in in the Arctic is really to the west, it's, or the, the western part of, of the, uh, the uh, Russian Arctic. And, uh, and it's passing the Norwegian coast. But you see, this has increased enormously. And yeah, last year, there was more than 10 million, or 2017, more than 10 million tons of cargo. That is, more than, that is 3 million tons more than it was at the most during the Soviet Union. And this year, there will be another 3 million tons. Of course, the LNG shipments are playing a big role in this. The, the um, uh, important are east-west connection, that is the Northern Sea Route. But as important, and which Kirsti was uh, alluding to or talking about, is, are the nor north-south connections. Because you have to connect the, the mainland to that east-west route. And the Russian rivers, the Ob, the NSA and the Lena, are such arteries going north-south. And uh, have always been used, but of course they are closed uh, during parts of the year due to ice. But this is, in the long term, we believe that will be a, a great source for, or an important source of cargoes for the, for the Northern Sea Route. An example of that was a shipment coming from uh, South Korea, going through the Suez Canal, coming to Kekenes, and then these uh, chemical reactors for a big chemical plants in Tobolsk was shipped from this specialized heavy lift vessel to uh, uh, riv Russian river barges and ri Russian river tugs, and then shipped another 4,000 kilometers down the Ob River. Now these shipments are happening at Sabeta because the Sabeta port has been developed. So it's all about logistics, and it, has to, you, it, it will always find the, the, the most efficient and effective way. Very impressive, uh, and maybe the oldest uh, uh, transportation system of the, or modern transportation system of the Arctic, is really Norilsk Nickels. I would say it's their enclosed or their, their uh, uh, own transportation system. It's not open to others. They use it to transport nickel out of Norilsk, uh, which is their very, very large, large, world's largest uh, nickel plants, and equipment in for 250,000 people who have no road connection. There's only a railway to a river port called Dudinka, and, and, and plane, and all, everything comes by ship for these 250,000 people. Very impressive system. But nothing is new under the sun, and uh, as you will see, and maybe it's a false dawn now as well, but this was people who started, Captain Wiggins and Jonas Lead started this already in, two, in 1874, in 1911, and with planning with the Kara Sea Route, Siberian Steamship Company, listed transshipment points, specially designed vessels, and so on. And then it went and became to nothing. But that was for political reasons. <laughs> China is definitely looking at the opportunities. They are, of course, looking everywhere, but they are looking at the opportunities of the Northern Sea Route. And Costco has started a regular semi line through the Northern Sea Route serving the north or the south, no, east-west the flows, but also uh, in the future we believe it will serve the, the ports of the Arctic. And of course, Maersk recently tested, uh, tested the Northern Sea Route, as we have all read about. We think in the longer term there will be Arctic transshipment hubs. It could be Hikness, Murmansk, one Russian, one, one, one Norwegian, and it could be 
uh, it could be uh, Petr Pavlovsk or Vladivostok, and, and another port on the other side, serving specialized vessels which could extend the season and be efficient in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this environment. And then later on, serving Sabetta and Tixi, and so on. These plants, China, as I said, they are, they are on the ball. Uh, they recently announced their Polar Silk Road strategy, which is an attachment to the Belt and Road Initiative. And as Hirschdick talked about, the Arctic Corridor. These are north-south connections, which are very important. Through these north-south connections, you could have energy, energy rolling as well. It could be on ships on the rivers, it could be on the railway. It could be LNG for remote industrial activity, meaning that you could do processing in situ both environmentally better and, and more economical and, and for, for, uh, for the activities. And this leads, I'm doing, yeah, a little bit. Uh, uh, this leads on to one of my pet projects, because we are involved in mining in Hekenes. And we have already had to close it once in 2015, because the commodity cycle went so sharply down that we had to close the, the mine. And we know that if we could create, produce a higher value product, it, we would have stood through the cycle. And the Arctic has a, a, the best opportunity almost of any place of combining gas as an input factor, I mean, energy of course, but also as a, as a chemical input factor, and minerals and metals, and fish, and so on, you know, for, for processing, so that you get a value added product which can stand the cycles and thereby making the, the Arctic more robust, or activities in the Arctic more robust. But it is really logistics which could make that possible. And then you come, what are the options? Could it be small-scale LNG from the LNG plants which are now popping up different places? Or could it be compressed natural gas serving the various uh, offshore developments uh, and taking care of the stranded gas, the associated gas, which is always associated to oil production, which is today being re-injected. Could that be brought ashore for industrial activity? And, of course, job creations, which are not purely offshore or not purely minerals and metals based. I think that's a very interesting prospect for uh, the Barents Sea, because we have here, it's, you know, here it's the resources on the shore, minerals, metals are there, both in the Kolmer Peninsula and the Scandinavian Peninsula, and then you have the gas in the sea. But it needs cooperation between companies, it needs political will, it needs uh, uh, someone who, you know, that needs co coordination. This will not happen on its own. But I think it has something to do with, with the future, a robust future. Getting close to ending, this is, I will not go, this is very crowded. It shows you just, there's a lot of studies of what you can do with gas. So this is, don't tr even try to look at it, but th th I can just tell you, <laughs> I can tell you that those are the, some of the studies just from Narvik, and then there are hundreds of studies about this uh, topic. So it's not no lack of knowledge, it's a matter of doing it. So the vision is go from raw materials and energy to something which has a high, higher value and is more processed. Yes, I, this one I will not really go through, but I think, of course, uh, I, I saw the previous, uh, I heard the previous uh, session, and of course, uh, the, the emergency preparedness is extremely important in the Arctic. There must be no accidents. You do have to do everything to avoid it. And I think today, Russian icebreaker support is really the most important feature or at this stage to, ha to, to, to help that not happening. Arctic Council is very important because those countries which are involved in the Arctic and close to the Arctic, who has an interest in sustainable development, both economically and environmentally, are part of the Arctic Council. Very important. And we, I think the same will happen in the Arctic, as happened in the North Sea, which is that with increased economic activity, numbers of ships increasing, you get better preparedness. You are, you are much better prepared for the uh, eventuality of, of accidents. So, land, going in for landing, the uh, Center for High North Logistics, I recommend you to look it up. It's, it's under the Nord University, but we also have very close uh, relationship and cooperation with the university here in, in Tromsø. And it's, it's working on information about uh, transport, uh, logistics and transportation in the Arctic. Studies with, together with the South Koreans, with China, and so on. Lots and lots of interesting information. And they also have an information office in Murmansk called the uh, Central for High North Logistics Information Office. And it's 
you know, really working on mapping what is happening in the Northern Sea Route. This is the map they produce every year for uh, about what is happening and trying to analyze what is what and so on. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>